Hello class, here is our second urinary system lecture. So it's a continuation looking at the anatomy. The last one we did the gross anatomy, intro to the kidney. Now we're getting into the microscopic part of it, the nephron, the tubes, and I'll talk about some kidney diseases. And then uh, the next lectures we'll get into kidney function, how we the kidneys do what they do. All right, let's go. So the unit in a kidney is a nephron. You have about a million in each. And uh, this is the basics right here. Take a look at it. You have a renal corpuscle. <clears throat> the corpuscle is the ball of capillaries. And remember, the blood is what's being filtered across this membrane here. We'll talk about that a lot today. And the tube system, that makes up a nephron. And this is nice, very simplistic. You can see, I'll just let you know the anatomy here. Uh, leaving this uh, capsule where the, ur the filtrate first collects, it will be urine by the time it's done, but filtrate is the fluid that comes out, filtered out. And you have the proximal convoluted tube. It's proximal, it's closest to the glomerulus. Then there's a loop. It was called the loop of Henle. It's called the nephron loop. You can have a descending part that goes down, <clears throat> and then next to it is an ascending part that goes up. They're actually right next to each other. Here, everything's spread out and simplified. Then the distal convoluted tube. Convoluted means it's lots of twists and turns. And then finally, all these tubules, nephrons, will, will go into collecting ducts, where by that time the filtrate will come down and you have the ability to control the amount of water. And then the result at the end of that collecting duct at the tip of the papilla will be the urine. So nephron has the corpuscle, which is this ball of capillaries called the glomerulus, and this capsule around it, glomerular capsule, or Bowman's capsule is always called. And then tubes, proximal, loop, distal tube. Beautiful illustration here. I'm taking a look at it. Oh. And what I want you to look at, I guess right now, is that what's in yellow here. So what you notice is this, this cup, this cup around it, right? But in reality, that cup comes around and it's continuous with this layer that is on the capillaries. Like that. So it formed by this ball of capillaries, you know, pushing onto this membrane. And as you go down, it's going to come around like this. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but this, uh, you just imagine that this ball of capillaries is coming down and it fits in this cup right here. But this cup, the outside of the cup, goes over the capillaries. So it just takes it and puts it around it, around all those, those capillaries. And we call the outside here, this would be the parietal layer, just like the parietal pleura lined your chest cavity. And the visceral layer is stuck on the capillaries, just like the visceral pleura was on the lung. And that visceral layer, if you look at them, they look really weird. They look like these, uh, some kind of jellyfish or something like this. But these would be these cells that have these feet that come out. They're called podocytes, like podiatry means feet. So these feet cells or make up that visceral layer. And that parietal layer is just squamous cells that make a cup. And that cup is gonna capture all the filtrate, the fluid, and bring it down the tubes. What I want you to note here is that the arteries that come in and out of this ball of capillaries, coming in is the afferent arteriole. Again, this system where A before E, afferent comes in, efferent is gonna leave. And the ball of capillaries is the glomerulus. And what you'll notice right away, if you're clever, you take a look at this, clever once, you'll see that the afferent is big and the efferent is smaller. And indeed, that's just by design. So think about what that does. It's like taking a garden hose and putting one of those, uh, the nozzles at the end, it's gonna increase the pressure. So by making this one smaller, it's gonna back up the blood in that ball of capillaries, and that pressure is going to increase. So that pressure is going to encourage more fluid to come out of the blood, be pushed out of the blood. Yeah. And these arterioles are surrounded by smooth muscles, so your body has the ability 
to constrict or relax those. And so you can affect the pressure. If you want more filtration of your kidneys, you can just clamp down on that efferent and make the afferent bigger. And you've increased that, that difference and the blood's gonna be more backed up and the pressure's gonna build and more fluid is gonna leave. On the other hand, if you relax uh, the efferents, the pressure is gonna decrease and you'll see the filtration rate goes down too. So what I'm just showing you is that the arterioles coming in and out um, uh, can be controlled and they make the pressure in this glomerulus, this ball capillary is higher. And this higher pressure encourages the fluid to be filtered out of the blood, which needs to happen. If your blood pressure drops or there's an, there's an issue, your kidneys stop working and you're gonna die. Your kidneys need to have blood pressure to, to keep filtering the blood and you have to filter the blood or else nitrogenous substances build up and you start showing some real serious problems. All right. Taking a look at some, some histology here. You can see the glomerulus is this ball of capillaries. This beautiful white space here. You can even see the squamous cells lining it. it will be the uh, capsular space where the filtrate is collected. And this is such a perfect section. And they looked at millions of them to get this one. Well, thousands of them. What you see is that this end is where the blood vessels are going to come into this capillary bed. And they even caught a little bit of the proximal tube leaving right there. So you can also, when you look at this thing, you can talk about the whole corpuscle. The urinary pole is where the fluid is leaving out that proximal convoluted tube. And the vascular pole is the blood vessels that are coming in. And you see the space right there just beautifully. So we're going to talk about the tubes. And um, indeed, you're going to have convoluted, means it's taken all these twists and turns. And the straight part of it, what you see in this loop. And then proximal distal, usually we talked about like your wrist and your elbow being proximal or distal to your body. But here it's proximal is close to the glomerulus and distal is away from it. And the loop used to be called loop of Henle, but nephron loop we're going to go with is uh, that straight part that dives down deep like that. So kind of putting it all together with some blood vessels as well. Hopefully you guys, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but take a look. You can see that uh, the artery, I'll do red, the artery is coming in, the afferent arterial. Here's the ball of capillaries. And here's the efferent leaving. And where does that blood vessel go next? This is unusual too, because you have an arterial coming into a capillary bed and usually a venule, a vein leaves it, right? But here you're having an arterial coming in and leaving and it goes to a second capillary bed before finally going to the veins. And so what you have here is a afferent, efferent leaving it, then paratubular capillaries go around the tubes. And there may be a vasorecta where it comes down straight like this and eventually it turns blue go to all the veins and it'll make its way back out to back to your body. That's the blood. And then the tubular system. Here you have the uh, black. You're going to have the capsule right here. And then the proximal tube is all this. Quite a bit to the proximal tube. Look at that convoluted, how crazy it is. It's going all around. <clears throat> Lots of surface area. And you'll see in that proximal part, like 70% of the water and the glucose is all taken back. So a lot going on there. So it's a, it's a thick, really active tube, that proximal part. So a lot happens right away. And then this loop, this nephron loop, both the descending going down and ascending coming back up, that loop is going to set up this uh, osmotic gradient where it's going to get saltier and saltier and saltier as you go deeper and deeper in the pyramid. And we'll see why that is. When that done with that loop, you have a distal tube, convoluted tube, you see it's a lot shorter. And then many distal tubes from nephrons will empty into this collecting duct. So the collecting duct's not really part of that nephron. It's the, it's the, the pipe that, that all the filtrate's gonna come down. Okay. I'll look at the histology. Again, if you're really good, you can look at a, a slide of kidney and and recognize, I'll, I'll point out that the proximal tube, look how big those cells are. 
how thick cuboidal they are, all the little microvilli, the extensions. So lots of surface area, like I said, most of the reabsorption of the fluid, the good stuff, happens in that proximal tube. You see the loop is very thin. Distal, again, there's lots going on there. And then the collecting duct coming down will not be that exciting. It has the ability to reclaim water, but that's about it. But that proximal convoluted tube, that's where most of the action takes place. All right, in the nephron world, in the kidneys, talk about two types. And about 80% are found scattered in the cortex, the cortical nephrons. But interestingly enough, these juxta medullary, which means like juxtaposition right next, the juxta medullary are right by the medulla. So they're deep in the cortex on the edge of that pyramid. And that's about 20%. It's about 80, 20%. But these ones, the juxta medullary, are very important in, in controlling your water, you know, how much you're going to pee out, or how much you're going to conserve. Because those juxta medullary ones have long loops, long, long loops of Henle. Beautiful. The cortical ones have shorter loops. I mean, they can dive into the medulla somewhat, but they don't go all the way down. So the juxta medullary, that 20%, are real important in setting up this really salty gradient and helping you conserve water if you need to. That's going to be the bottom line. All right, let's talk about this filtration membrane. If you remember respiratory system, we just did it. We talked about that respiratory membrane. Remember, it was the endothelium of the capillary, basement membrane, and then you had the alveolar cells, the type one, the flat ones. So it was a very narrow, um, very narrow respiratory membrane so that you could have diffusion of the gases across it, right? Well, now we're gonna look at this um, um, filtration membrane in the kidney. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a preview. You're gonna have uh, the artery, and it happens to be really holy, it has lots of holes in it, here's the artery. Then you're going to have a basement membrane, because you always do. And then you're going to have the, um, the layer, that visceral uh, layer of the um, um, Bowman's capsule is going to have these, uh, these little feet. The little, I mean, these are podocytes, so these are little feet. And what it gives you are these little slits. So up here, let's say these are blood cells, big blood cells. The blood cells are way too big to ever get through this membrane. But um, all the little things, all the little uh, uh, glucose and uh, water and sodium and magnesium, that's going to be able to make it through the little slit, through this membrane, and then through these slits. And uh, that will become the filtrate down here. So this membrane here, I gave you a little preview now and I'll get into it now in detail. That filtration membrane is how our kidneys work, how the blood is filtered across this thin membrane that allows some things through, but not the big things, big proteins, blood cells, red, white platelets, they can't get through. You don't want that, you want those staying in the blood, but the little things come through. All right, so um, you take a look at it, beautiful illustration here, you see, uh, um, the, uh, the glomerulus is this ball of capillaries. I'm looking at those podocytes, these yellow things. I see them stuck on there. And then I see uh, the ar afferent, afferent arterioles feeding it. And then this, this cup here is going to capture the fluid and bring it down this, this tube to be worked on in the tubes. Ah, oh, beautiful illustration here. This really shows how the, uh, uh, how the, um, this outer, uh, uh, parietal layer is continuous with this visceral layer. And this doesn't really show it. It should look like little foot cells on here, but it's just diagrammatic, showing this ball of capillaries pushed in here and how this layer is continuous with the podocytes like that. And what you're doing is pushing the filtrate. We'll go down this little funnel and start its way down the tubes. All right, this can be confusing looking at this particular drawing, but it's a good one, so that's, that's, that's why I have it here. But I want you to look at, just orient yourself. Um, here's going to be the blood coming in through that afferent arterial, and you can see I'm pointing out the capillaries. 
So this is just a section. Of course, the capillaries are going nuts. It's like a big ball going every direction. But these ones are cut so you can see them cut open. And the blood eventually will leave out this efferent arterial, which should be smaller, right? So blood's coming in, going into these capillaries. And then take a look at this drawing, this cool area here. Like in any one of these, you can see. You guys see that? Yeah, you see that, what I was drawing before. You see these little podocytes, these little foot cells, it's gonna be a basement membrane. And then there's gonna be, uh, the artery is gonna be really leaky, the capillary right there. So that's what we're seeing when we look right there. And that's this filtration membrane. The blood is forced in this ball of capillaries and the pressure is gonna push the fluid out through this membrane. And not everything can get through, not the big stuff, but anything small in water just leaves like that. I think that's a good look there. And you don't forget the proximal convoluted tube is leaving this capsule. It all collects in this space, the fluid. So again, to review, and I'll show you even again, I'm going to go after it. The, the filtration membrane is made up of, of these three layers, all right? So the capillaries in the glomerulus, you're going to see they're wicked leaky, they have big holes in them, so that uh, anything between 50 and 100 uh, nanometers in diameter, anything uh, bigger than that can't get through it. So red blood cells are way too big, it just goes on by. But small, tiny proteins, anything dissolved can move through there. So you see fenestrated means that the uh, has fenestra or holes. Remember we did bones? We had foramen, well, foramen was a hole, and a fossa was a depression. A fenestra, uh, uh, French for window is fenetre, isn't it? It's, it's, it's Latin meaning a window. And so you're going to see that the capillary itself has lots of holes in it. And all capillaries are leaky, but these are really leaky. Um, they have this like a sieve that you put in, you drain your pasta in. It has all these little slits, holes in them that let the water through, but not your, your noodles. Then the basement membrane. You're going to see uh, the basement membrane is going to be uh, thick. Well, it can't be too thick, but it's going to be an area between the, uh, the capillary and then these podocytes. And it's critical, too. If you look at all, a lot of kidney disease will can affect your glomerular basement membrane. Um, yeah, it's also... At this point, I think I'll, I'll let you know. It also happens to be um, negatively charged. Now, I've been talking about size so far, how small things can get through these little slits, but that big things can't. But charge makes a difference, too, um, because your big proteins, uh, your, your albumins, fibrinogen, these things like that, are negatively charged. And so they're repelled by this basic membrane. They, Remember, the negative charged basement membrane would attract positively charged ions. But negative ones, it's like two magnets. They, they, they don't want to go. So this area is actually helping filtration and keeping most of the big proteins out, but allowing uh, especially things that are positively charged, but neutrally charged and even small negatively charged can make it through. But big things with a negative charge are not, I find it difficult to be filtered. So there's that glomerular basement membrane that every epithelial tissue has a basement membrane. And then finally, this interesting, I'll show you some beautiful pictures of um, these uh, podocytes, what again, which means foot cells. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cell like this, there's a nucleus and it has these big arms that come out and these little feet. Oh yeah, look at this, little feet like that. And then, uh, Oh yeah, and then here's a capillary. Let's see. Oh yeah, and then um, maybe there's another one over here, and that's got a little arm that comes out, that fills in. There. Oh, 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 look at that. And there's another one over here that comes in. Oh, that's really cool looking. That's really good. So that that shows that uh, here's this capillary, lots of holes in it, right? And then uh, I can add, uh, I think I do purple, I can do the basement membrane right here. Underneath, ah, I didn't leave much room for it. There you go. 
so yeah, these podocytes are, um, have these, these, these little fingers, and the fingers are going to make little slits. They're going to help also filter. You already had the holes in the capillary basement membrane, and then you've got these podocytes. They're going to wrap around the capillaries to provide these little slits that only allow um, things that are about 25 nanometers or so to slip by, so only the small stuff. So I'll just put this all together. Oh, just beautiful. Look at that. <sighs> wow. Just feast your eyes on this beautiful, beautiful uh, electron micrograph. It's been artificially colored, but look at those holes. It's a fenestrated capillary. So glomerular capillaries are leakier than your, even your typical leaky capillary, but they only allow things. Imagine a blood cell. It's going to be like this big, a red blood cell. Yeah, it's not getting through these holes, is it? No. Unless there's damage, then you can pee some blood if you have damage. But <clears throat> you can see those little holes are allowing small things through. So a gorgeous picture showing how the capillary is fenestrated as these fenestra are windows. And then beautiful electromicrograph. I'll show you several of these. We're looking at this whole ball. You know, this is a glomerulus ball of capillaries. And PO means podocytes. You can see them on there. Let me show you. Wow, that is amazing, absolutely amazing. Look at this freaking podocyte. Look at these slits. These are like little fingers coming together like this from adjacent podocytes, leaving these little slits in between that can filter that only allow the small stuff through. So podocytes talk about having these like primary arms and like little secondary arms, and then their little feet that come out, these little feet. And this inset even shows in uh, detail these little filtration slits. So these podocytes completely cover the capillaries, and they're like a second line in the filter after the holy capillary, base of membrane, and then these podocytes. I guess the third line, isn't it? Again, just absolutely gorgeous. Look at the detail on this. Look at this podocyte. Look at the fingers coming together, this filtration. Just, just gorgeous. There's even some evidence here that um, these uh, these little feet, these little processes, can move, and so you can, if you need greater filtration, they can like spread out a little bit more, and if you can do with less filtration, they can come together a little. So there's even a thought to be a little bit of a uh, regulation right there. Remember, I told you, you could regulate it at the blood vessel level by making more pressure, there'd be greater filtration. But here, you even talk of the the filtration slits can make it easier or harder for filtration. All right, and then this is absolutely beautiful. I showed you a similar thing with a respiratory membrane. It's right there, it's just absolutely amazing. So if I were to put a big, here's a big red blood cell, this big, yeah. And then we're looking at right here. You guys see that? Here's the, It's in this inset. So I know I've been probably saying this two or three times, but just so you see, this is the basement membrane, which is, it has its own job. It's critical too in uh, preventing negatively charged things and, and uh, have a, doing its own filtering. And then I can see on the inside, this is the, I'll do it in red, the capillary. See, it has these holes in it. And there's a couple, but these holes are small enough to let small things through. And then finally, the podocytes. We're looking at the little feet processes down here. And here's you know the big cell, and you can almost see a hand coming down, but these little tiny slits that are formed by these foot cells that act as that that third layer in the filtration membrane. All right, this is delicate. Things can go wrong with kidney diseases. You can have problems with any one of these parts. You can imagine if there's a lot of damage, you're just letting blood and small and proteins getting through. You know, if it's not a nice filter intact. So, um, and if the filter gets glommed up, you can see how you're not going to filter. You're not going to make much urine. You're not going to get rid of waste. So you can see this delicate membrane, how beautiful, small, and delicate it is, how things can go wrong. All right. Again, some more, some more views. I think this is very, very helpful. If, if you don't get what I'm talking about with podocytes is that you can see them here and how they interdigitate their little fingers 
to form these little slits. And then this one shows you the, uh, the inside of the cap layer with all those fenestra or holes in it. You see that? And then the blue, the teal, is the basement membrane. So again, that's that filtration membrane. You can see when you have, uh, see, even after heavy exercise, but you can have some um, some proteins getting through. You know, blood pressure is really high. You're working out. If there's any damage at all, you have a little hemoglobin and such. But normally, um, that stuff. But we'll talk more about urine formation. All right, another view. This this whole capsule business. They're continuous. I hope you get that. You get this glomerulus and it just comes in and gets a coating around it and then also makes the cup around it. So I'll draw it again here showing, here it is, these podocytes, it's the visceral layer, and then it's continuous with this parietal layer which makes this cup, this Bowman's capsule or urinary capsule on the outside that the urine is going to accumulate and make its way onto the tube system. All right. I found this. I know you're saying to yourself, Parmalee, I think I got it. But another, just another way of looking at it, you can see uh, this holy, holy capillary. And then you see these slits of the podocytes. So it's a, like a double layer of filter paper and then a basement membrane between two. All right. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Now what we're going to have is a system where your kidney has a million little blood pressure detectors in each. It really does. And uh, we're going to see this little uh, blood pressure sensing apparatus stuck next to each one of these glomeruli. And it's called juxta glomerular apparatus. So it means it's right next to the glomerulus. It's a little confusing, right? Um, we had another juxta, but um, this one juxta glomerular apparatus is going to be uh, a sensor for blood pressure. And let me tell you a couple ways that it happens. And if you look at it, I have a couple, several illustrations to show you this. If you look here, look here. So you, uh, you guys know the glomerulus. Oops, where's right? You know the glomerulus. You got that. What you see is that the tube system is going to come back when it's done with the loop. It's going to come back right to that glomerulus it came from and just kind of kiss it. Just get really close to it so it can sense the blood pressure there and then it's going to go off in the distal part. So this area, if you look at the tube right here, it looks the nuclei are really close together. It's really dense. So here's the tube and you'll see the epithelium is particularly... Maybe here's more normal. We call it the macula densa. The macula means spot, so it's the dense spot. And uh, right here. And this region is going to be right next to that uh, afferent arteriole that's coming in, right next to it that's going to come to glomerulus, right? And there's modified smooth muscle cells around it here, too. Yeah. And this whole apparatus, these Modified smooth muscle cells are going to measure your blood pressure, how strong they're being stretched. And these cells in this tube that have come back are going to measure the levels of sodium, really, that are um, coming up through this tube. And together, these two things, one and two, when the blood pressure gets low, and we'll see what that means is that the sodium levels are low, it's going to secrete a hormone called renin. And I have some other slides, so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. And the renin is going to help you increase your blood pressure. So this macula densa are these dense, tall cells in this tube that are going to secrete this renin. And then next to this part of the apparatus are going to be baroreceptors or pressure receptors around that arteriole. They're going to directly measure your blood pressure right there. So here it is in some words. So I think you, you all understand that when that vessel becomes less stretchy, it means your blood pressure is low, right? If your blood pressure is really high, it's really going to pulse, right? But if it's low, it's not going to stretch much at all. 
So there you can see, sure, okay, then you release this renin, and you told me that renin is going to increase your blood pressure. You haven't told me how, but I'll buy that. But the tube, you know, why would you say that tube returning if it has low levels of sodium? You know, why would that have anything to do with low blood pressure? Well, I'll tell you right now. What's going on is that in this series of tubes, you're going to make the filtrate because it's going to come out of the blood, the water. It's going to go through these tubes. And if the fluid in the tubes is moving quick enough, it turns out that your body can take that sodium back. No, if it's not going super fast, it can. Um, if it's going really fast, <laughs> that means uh, that the sodium is, 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 is going to be left. But if the, 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 if the fluid is going very slowly, that means it has time to take back all the sodium. So if it notices at the other, at this like sensing station, damn, why is there no sodium or like no, hardly any? That means that fluid had to be moving so slowly that it's had time to reclaim all the sodium. So what you expect there is some sodium has gotten past it because it's moving fast enough. If the fluid is moving too slow, it means your blood pressure is low. And that means it's moved so slow um, that your cells have had time to take out all of the sodium. I think of it like a conveyor belt. You know, if it's if you you're a worker at a conveyor belt and <clears throat> you're trying to pick out the bad fruit as they're coming by, if it's moving very slowly and you got a couple workers, they're gonna get every bad fruit out of there. They're gonna have enough time to pick them out. But if you speed up that conveyor belt, there's always going to be some that get by because they can't get them all. It's the same thing with the sodium here. You have low blood pressure, the fluid is moving slowly, and that means there's time to take out all the sodium. Your body recognizes that and says, damn, that fluid is moving slow, your blood pressure must be low. So that's, I kind of did a long explanation, but that's why uh, when you have decreased sodium, your body recognizes that your blood pressure is low and it secretes the renin. And then it can do it directly by measuring the freaking blood pressure and the artery. And then it also secretes renin if it gets too slow. So that's the story. I'll talk about what renin does. I almost did it when we did the endocrine system as a hormone, but I told you I was going to hold off on it. So we'll talk how renin is going to increase your blood pressure. So some more views here. You can see, again, here is uh, the glomerulus, all these capillaries. And then uh, right here is your macula densa, the, the dark spot where these cells are measuring sodium levels that are coming by. And when it gets um, where there's not much sodium, it's like that fluid must be moving slow. I got to increase this guy's blood load pressure. And then in the arterial, it doesn't show it here, there's going to be baroreceptors that are directly measuring blood pressure, and they will also cause these cells to increase, secrete renin. And here's some renin granules. I just found this cool picture, so you can see that. That will be just waiting. If your blood pressure tanks, they release the renin. You're gonna, I'll tell you how that is gonna increase your blood pressure, keep you alive. Mm, just another beautiful view. You guys feeling good about this? You feeling your afferent arterial big, carrying the blood in? efferent smaller, thus causing pressure in these capillaries. And what's that going to do, that pressure? We'll talk about that next lecture, but it's going to force the fluid out. All the small stuff is going to come out, good and bad, into this urinary space. And it's going to collect and go down that tubule. And you can even see this proximal tubule. See all these little microvilli? Tons of surface area where these cells can reclaim the good, reclaim the water, and get rid of some bad stuff. So that filtrate is what we call the fluid that comes out, collects in this capsule. That filtrate will go through all the tubes and will end up in your kidney as urine, and then it will go down, stored in your bladder, get rid of it. All right, well in this lecture, I'll talk about a few issues. Um, I talk about some pathologies. First of all, this polycystic kidney disease, and I, I had someone previously come and give a whole talk on this, and how interesting, it's a genetic disease 
what happens is that your kidneys develop cysts on them. Um, and even a lot of, I see a lot of cadaver uh, kidneys with cysts on them, but this is where you end up with these fluid filled cysts. So it's not cancer, it's not cancerous. It's simply your kidney is just progressively taken over by these huge growing cysts. And it, you know, it depends on the speed of it, but if it progresses enough, you're gonna need a new kidney because your kidney function gets less and less and issues start popping up. Then you'll need what's called dialysis and then a new kidney. Um, so you can see it's not that rare. And the kidneys, my God, they can be huge. I have a picture of this. Yeah. And again, a normal kidney, you know about this, well, is that useful? <laughs> I think. Um, these are huge, these are huge. And they're filled with cysts. They can make your abdomen protrude and uh, they become more and more useless. So polycystic kidney disease, genetic component, uh, a slow replacement of your kidney with these cysts, not cancerous, but still they're destroying your kidney. Kidney transplants. Um, pretty straightforward transplant. I talked about a um, heart transplant, lung transplant, but a kidney, yeah, it's a lot easier. Um, and what they do is you need, you need a donor kidney. That's the problem. You, you can't legally buy or sell a kidney. You can donate a kidney um, in this country. There's a whole documentary on Netflix, <clears throat> some places in Pakistan, et cetera. We don't want to set up a system where you can um, sell your organs to the poor, selling them to the richer people. It's a lot of issues there. Um, but let's say you get yourself on, your hands on a kidney. Um, and then remember immunology too. It'd be nice to get it from uh, an identical twin, if not a relative. Uh, it's gotta be a human these days. We haven't figured that out. Um, and before you get a, a kidney transplant, your kidneys will, will be, it could be acute where it's a very rapid onset kind of thing, but it's usually a chronic thing where at some point you get dialysis or it's called hemodialysis. A dialysis machine. It's where they hook you up to a machine and it filters your blood for you. It's got a membrane in there. Uh, your kidneys do a lot, so it's not ideal, you, uh, but it's going to keep you alive. You go through this dialysis, it's a big machine, takes hours, and so it's not a, a it'll keep you alive, but you, you'd rather have a, a kidney. And there's another kind of dialysis too, where they will um, inject fluid into your peritoneal cavity what 20% of people are eligible for this and then they let the fluid sit for hours and they drain that fluid and that fluid will accumulate um, toxins um, and so it's a way of kind of like just washing this clean fluid and replacing it well, is a method of dialysis too but let's say you find a kidney donor and as I mentioned in earlier lectures ideally we're just going to simply grow extra kidneys from stem cells no problems with uh, host transplant issues and compatibility. Um, you may even like change a kidney, like you change your oil, you know, you get, every 20 years, you get new, some new kidneys. I mean, that's, I think the future will bring that. Um, but let's get about today. So you get yourself a kidney and then uh, what they do is they, uh, they, they don't need to put the kidney, you don't want to put the kidney back in the original place because it's, it's just held in there mainly by fat. And if you were to try to place it, it'd be highly mobile. Uh, that would not be, be good. And besides, you might as well just put the kidney down in the pelvis because it's right next to the bladder and uh, there's a blood supply right there. That's all you need in a kidney. You got to connect the ureter to the bladder and then you got to connect an artery into the kidney. And so as you can see, it's much more stable to put it down in your pelvis. It's closer to the bladder and it works fine. You could put it in your neck, and, well, not really, but you put it anywhere in your body, um, just where there's space, as long as you can connect uh, blood vessels, arteries and veins, and you can connect the ureter to the bladder. So kidney transplant, it's one that we've, uh, we got the surgery down uh, uh, pretty well. All right, some of the kidney diseases, and, and, and you'll see it's, uh, Kidneys, you need kidneys. Um, you'll see if you your kidneys are failing, it can be acute, which means it can be a toxin or some kind of damage that quickly happens. Or it could be a chronic kidney disease, CKD, chronic kidney disease, where uh, they are going to just, um, the functioning will get less and less. You'll notice this with blood tests. You'll see uh, nitrogen substances in your blood. Um, things are not getting filtered out like they should. And you can test, we'll talk about that, how well your kidneys are functioning. 
So it's often a you know, progressive downhill thing and, and many things go wrong if you can't filter your blood. Your kidneys are, are critical to life. Nephritis is just gonna be inflammation in the kidney. There's many different causes. And then I want you to know about glomerulonephritis. That means that there's the glomerulus is uh, inflamed and there's issues. And what really causes it, it's usually um, a bacterial infection, strep, something like that, and it causes an antibody reaction. And, and this, these clumps of antibodies and antigens will clog the, <clears throat> the delicate membrane in the glomerulus. They'll clog that all up and that causes inflammation. White blood cells will come there and you get just a progressive destruction of the glomeruli. It can be long-term chronic uh, or it can be more uh, fast acting. And if you'll take a look at my illustrations I gave to you, I don't know if you noticed from the few illustrations you've seen in this lecture, but this glomerulus has way too many nuclei. It's just, it's too dense. Um, so you could do, you know, they, they do a biopsy of the kidney. They put a big needle in, they take out a small amount of kidney, they can look in the microscope and they can you know, even see the progression of that and diagnose you with glomerulonephritis. Um, again, depends how serious, how long-term um, before you need a new kidney. And lastly, this sucker. You imagine trying to pee this out. Uh, you, don't know, you don't know the size of the, uh, the, um, the ureters and the urethra. And even these things can clog up in your nephron tubes, these little things. And once they get bigger than uh, five millimeters or so, um, and let's look at the sharp edges on this, my God. Um, they're obviously going to clog things up. So what, what are kidney stones or colliculi? Look at these beauties here. Look at that. Turns out there's many kinds of kidney stones made of different chemicals, but they're all precipitates of, uh, of uh, crystals in your urine, in your filtrate. And so um, some of the causes, I mean, old age, obesity, uh, a high protein diet, a high salt diet. Um, what else? Um, dehydration too, yes. So when you get the fluid being concentrated, and you guys, chemistry, you make crystals, you make concentrated solutions. As soon as you have a seed of a crystal, it, it will grow. It will grow um, with time. And so that's what happens here. Let's say, I've heard diet soda is getting, being um, uh, implicated in this, but you have a high protein diet, you have a lot of material, your kidneys are, are trying to flush out and you don't drink much. And so it's very concentrated. And you can see a small crystal, once it starts building, become bigger. They're made of normally calcium oxalate and there's other, other chemicals, uh, struvite. There's different types of kidney stones. Um, and we'll talk about gallstones later too. But the kidney stones can, uh, can lodge on the side in various places. Um, somewhere there's some constrictions here are gonna be uh, here at the, where the ureter leaves, um, where this ureter goes over the pelvic brim, it's another spot. And then uh, where it enters the bladder here, right here, is another constriction. So these are common spots where, um, or in the kidney itself up here, uh, where stones can get caught. And they may pass on their own. They're small enough. I haven't had one, but I've heard it's incredibly painful. I mean, some of you out there have had kidney stones. Um, and so there are options, of course. Uh, well, what they can do, here's some pictures of some other ones. Look at that, really interesting looking ones. A uric acid, oh sure. So too much uric acid, um, you know, uh, calcium oxalate, look at that. Uh, we were gonna look in our, our urine lab, we were gonna spin down some of your urine in a centrifuge and look at the crystals in there. And you'd see the microscopic crystals, but uh, if they were to grow, you can imagine uh, if they were stuck in your renal pelvis and grow, and then they can't fit through the ureter. And then your ureter, when it's clogged by one, will constrict harder to try to pass that. And uh, uh, um, what they can do is they can do this. Um, uh, they can do surgery. They can go in, take it out if it's too big, or they can uh, put sound waves in there to break it up into little pieces that hopefully you can pee out without problems. They can put a scope up your urethra and go up that direction. Um, so there's options to do the kidney stones. Um, you may be told just to try to pass it, drink lots of fluid. All right, I found these uh, these beautiful phone covers. I would love to have this. I haven't actually 
figured out where to buy them. But um, you can see this gorgeous podo sites here. You look at that glomerulus there, color eyes. So hope you guys got the uh, um, the anatomy, gross anatomy of a kidney, the nephron, especially that filtration membrane. I kind of went over that again and again. And then uh, we talked about kidney stones, glomerulonephritis, kidney transplants, and polycystic kidney disease. All right, my next lecture, we'll get into some of the function of the kidneys, how urine is produced, uh, talk about your filtration rate, uh, and uh, a little more of the chemistry. All right, see you guys.